Thanks, Romy, and hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so Mike and I are going to be presenting our thoughts on temporary to timeless today. Uh, we're working in different offices, so hopefully this will work out quite well. Um, yeah, I guess before lockdown and before the pandemic, we were considering ideas about sort of how temporary interventions could uh, inspire, influence, and inform the permanent and, and create these timeless and impactful and engaging spaces. I guess what um, lockdown's brought to the table is actually looking at how we reevaluate our relationship with spaces and how, you know, looking for new meaning and importance, we've seen so much space come to light with the, the shift from everyone in their cars and on public transport, a lot of people are becoming much more localised and, and looking at how we walk and have a, a much more active landscape. Um, so, but how do we make these permanent features and, and, and a permanent future, so to speak? We've seen the quick responses. Um, you know, using the language of kind of barriers, really. And I think ultimately, yes, they're making a difference, giving us the space. But I think this image in itself demonstrates that that language is, is associated with, with construction and roadworks and, and disruption, ultimately. And I think it needs to be a, a bit clever and a bit smarter about how we start to accommodate more. So, you know, there's been some creative responses. This was uh, part of the Better Bankside work down in um, south of the river in London. And I think, it's, you know, ultimately it's a creative idea and a great improvement, but they're, they're isolated. They're not built into the, the wider spaces and the kind of frameworks that kind of can start to really influence and inform the future of our public realm. I think it needs to be integrated much better into long-term strategies. So, you know, recent events have demonstrated that people want change. We, you know, we're looking at this idea of a new normal, and perhaps we've got to look outside of our, our kind of comfort zone and our our own industries and look at the art world for instance most recently with the the statue in Bristol where you know the community decided it wasn't relevant and quickly and, and playfully perhaps you know Banksy came up with this sketch of an alternative and then Mark Quinn only last week replaced it with a with a much more um, symbolic gesture and I think that's is really exciting so perhaps you know this idea of tactical and temporary urbanism can really help to make the changes we need you know, looking at spaces with a fresh perspective. Here again, we've got JR, the, you know, the, the photographer and kind of big uh, canvas artist who's done stuff all over the world. And it's, it's taking the time to explore these spaces with fresh eyes and, and also use the temporary to, to create the, the opportunity for people to see the, the spaces with, with a new perspective. You know, the, the idea of these um, meanwhile spaces, perhaps they're or, or as some developers are now calling them worthwhile, which I think gives them a little bit more credence, but more often than not, they are these kind of um, outlets and kind of signifiers of the change and not symbolic of the existing community. And, and I think there's time to, um, to ask for more, more than beer and burgers, ultimately, and change the, the kind of aesthetic as well. You know, we're so used to this. And I think, again, these have their places, but there's a perception associated with them and it is temporary. And I think if we start to look at the work of, you know, Vestra's parklets, for instance, they have a bit more of a, a design aesthetic and a bit more in keeping with the more permanent sort of landscape. Um, and they can start to play a vital role in the development of our cities. You know, we've seen conversations about Oxford Street and that's taken, you know, most of my working life, if not my, my whole life, to even consider maybe pedestrianising. And yet, Here's an image of Soho this summer where it's, it's completely empty and we, we need to start looking at the spaces, again, looking at them and seeing what they can do. This Soho returns, this idea of a sociable Soho, it's been, you know, an epicentre of the West End, a place for, you know, culture and creativity to come together and this simple gesture of allowing cafes to move with outside of their sort of red line, if you like, all too often we've been a, a society where you've got to stick within the, the spaces and not step outside the line or the rope. And, and now it's become a bit more cosmopolitan. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity to take out of this crisis. Looking at wider uh, initiatives from Westminster and this playful sketch from Peter Murray of New London Architecture sort of sh shows a Soho reimagined, a vision for a more sociable Soho. And that accompanied with the wider Initiatives again, Vestra looking at the, the Fitz Park stuff with Fitz uh, Rovia Bid just north of Oxford Street um, and the wild, wild West End, the wider West End initiative to sort of create a much greener, more hospitable landscape, turning the hostile hospitable and making our landscapes more resilient. So we're going to look at today with five themes, you know, the, the idea of a community connector, this idea of a catalyst, um, 
social cultural region of uh, rejuvenation um, and how that temporary starts to inform the permanent. And then we're going to look to some of the work we're working on uh, with McGregor Coxall and sort of putting embedding this idea into our projects themselves from a project in Bristol to some wider projects uh, internationally down in Australia. I think there's a great opportunity and I think first off I'm going to take you down to, um, to, to Caracas in South America in Venezuela. Slightly different place than in London perhaps that we've just been talking about or Bristol but you know I think this, this opportunity uh, collaborative partnership with the British Council look to, to reframe spaces and explore ways to revigorate a city that's going through some really testing times at the moment. It's um, got some very serious issues and some big challenges, but um, it, it, it's got, you know, some really positive things going on with it as well. And I think it's a city that developed quickly in the, in the boom of the oil industry back in the, in the 50s. And some of the architecture really re represents this, this demand and this kind of culture where likes of Burley Marx from the landscape world and Ormsted from Central Park in New York and, and Villanueva and Joe Ponte, some great architects of their time were appointed to develop this kind of formal city. And yet a city of contrast and, and kind of spatial orientation started to create these infills and it's so commonly seen across South America where you've got barriers and favelas taking in these spaces and starting to be a bit more, uh, starting to facilitate the needs of the community where you know, perhaps they've fallen outside of the traditional formal city. Um, again, you know, everyone's seen the pictures portrayed of Caracas, and I'm not going to undermine any of the difficulties there. We've all seen these in the news, but it, it isn't all about this. And I think there's some really interesting points where we're starting to see people sowing the seeds of change. And yes, despite the difficulties, I think there is some ex interesting hope. And this is a a project with the partners I was working with in Kersion as architects in um, Caracas, looking at how we start to perhaps disrupt and, and adjust and play with the fabric of the city to allow the citizens to really start to make their mark and reclaim the spaces in, in ways that perhaps are unusual to us here in the UK. To allow me to understand, given the context and constraints of the, the country itself, I had to really, using the title of the brief effectively, reframe spaces, work with the community to understand how they experience the city through their eyes. So prior to going, I, uh, I developed the, the traditional kind of viewfinder model where, you know, like you did at art school, you, you created a viewpoint and framed a view to, to really understand it. So I sent this ahead of me to, to the partners and some of the team and the community that I was working with. And using social media and hashtags enabled me to get a little bit of an understanding of what they thought you know, focusing on the positive rather than all these negative images and challenging images and look at what things they could celebrate and really use to kind of grow ideas from. That started to stem ideas into what became the Catalyst Cube, a thing that ultimately is a modular piece of construction but designed to be placed directly into the landscape, creating an instant local focal point and catalyst for conversation to, to be reconfigured and curated by the community and often that meant we might get things wrong, but people would see the space with fresh eyes and be able to see what they truly wanted from the space. Launched in November last year, we've had a number of different cultural activations and engagements since then, and it's, it's due to relocate around the city over a number of times to really create that kind of carnival of expectation. The, the idea that they'll, they'll get the cube and what does that mean? And each community will enable them to teach the next. So you'll learn and, and start to streamline and make it more efficient but also engaging with the natural environment, looking at how we really inform it, hosting events, looking at how you can immediately change the, the social, physical and, and environmental fabric of the city just by dropping this kind of beacon into the, into the uh, public realm. Um, education again is critical and I think that idea of sharing knowledge as the cube moves from one place to the other, but also creating this hub for different communities to come together and once the day it was launched we had a number of uh, requests we asked for people to come and uh, offer opinion and curate the space for their own so we've had puppet shows we've had different events we've had bicycle workshops cinema screenings educational opportunities the possibilities are endless and that's what's been so fascinating is that with this catalyst cube 1.0 it's been a real great learning curve for us as a practice to understand how people take something and use it for themselves, interpreting it in different ways, reducing cost up front. And on my return at this article popped into the AJ, 
and the former CEO of Grosvenor wrote, you know, we've got to think differently. We're not, we're not the enemy, but we're not doing something right. And I think it's that acknowledgement and recognition that we need a new model for engagement and participation from the first step. So I wrote to him and we had a conversation and he invited me to put forward some ideas. One here at Grosvenor Square with their wider development um, and then looking at their more tricky site down at the biscuit factory. It's an asset for them ultimately. It's testing ideas in real time, understanding what works and sometimes what doesn't. But it's not a report on a bookshelf. It's not a digital thing that possibly most people don't see. It's a physical thing that's tangible. You can interact with it, you can test it, and you can then start to really learn what people want. And I think that's a really exciting part of this meanwhile process. It, we're looking at ways to bring it here. It's not just for the South American market. It's, a, it's an item that can be completely reconfigured, tailored to the, the kind of cultural demands. And I think this gives people a sense of ownership and agency in their city. With dwindling social infrastructure, for instance, we can start to reintroduce little bits of what the community need most, providing that bridge between big development and existing residents to start to create that interface with what the existing community need. And they can feel part of the larger development, whereas ultimately in the current process, it feels alien. We can start to showcase new art and emerging talent, really championing existing kind of culture. And then there's scope to bring in the digital which is something that we've been exploring with the hybrid idea. So you've got both items really capturing data, monitoring how it's used and further strengthening the future thinking of big projects, small projects, working with developers, communities, and really making a holistic approach. So continuing on that discussion about creativity and art, um, I want to kind of fly us over from Caracas to Sydney um, and provide a bit of an example of a project that we've been working in, on for a number of years as, as part of a wider regeneration project, which is looking at the lost urban spaces in the city, um, which are the laneways, and how creative arts were a kind of key catalyst to transforming the perspective and behaviour of how these laneways were, were perceived. And so the city of Sydney, as part of this kind of wider commission, looked at eight key laneways, and they wanted to uh, essentially allow people to see what the potential of these laneways were through the, through the lens of art and, and creativity. And in particular, how um, social, economic and cultural activation these spaces can kind of really enliven them and, and make them a key urban space for people to use and visit. So the, the, for us, the, the, the idea was about um, kind of educating and informing people on the impact of climate change. Obviously, COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a key challenge that we're facing right now. But the bigger underlying problem in all society at the moment is climate. And how do we start to create a more uh, sustainable way of living and, and using our cities? And so this design intervention was looking at combining the landscape of weather and topography with the architecture of catastrophe and the interactive technology of digital games. And it was, it was framed as seven meter bar. And it was called seven meter bar because what we were trying to do was create an intervention that was, uh, I guess, a collection of uh, disused rubbish from various places um, set at a, a level that is seven meters, which if we don't enact on climate change, will mean that this laneway will be underwater and it won't be a usable space for people in the future. And so taking this kind of idea of the, the lost uh, clutter of around the area, uh, such as the city's depot, we used old disused boats, uh, rubbish, cars, any of the uh, fragments that we could put together as part of a, an installation. And that installation then created this kind of, um, I guess, an attractor. Plugged inside that was a bar and that bar was kind of complemented by technologies as well, which allowed interaction and uh, animation on the actual screens. It was showing people swimming. It was allowing people to understand um, the fact that these could be very vibrant places for uses, but also about educating people on the kind of um, the bigger picture in which we should be looking at urban revitalization. But this wasn't just one scheme, there was like a series of laneway interventions and it was all framed again around art and this was a really interesting one called In Between the Two Worlds by Jason Wing. This, this was looking at creating a, a laneway that brought two cultures together, Aboriginal culture and Chinese culture. It was looking at the auspicious clouds of, and heaven and bringing it together. And so this creative way is starting to take these pretty dirty grubby laneways and make them into kind of real interesting places for people to see. 
Another one was called The Forgotten Songs. It was an installation really about highlighting to people that our urbanity has essentially separated us from nature. And so the flora and fauna of which is something of a value to us has become disconnected. And so these empty bird cages were references to the fact that the birds aren't necessarily using our urban spaces now and we should be rethinking that. But the, the narrative and the reimagination of these laneways through creative arts really spurred the city of Sydney to look at the bigger picture and invest in these spaces, create them as accessible um, urban spaces for people to use, but also opportunities for more businesses to, to kind of utilise as well. And so as part of that laneway um, revitalisation programme, we were commissioned to look at three laneways as part of it. And we started to look at how these flexible streets can cater for foods and markets for the different cultures and uses in the area, looking at still embedding creative arts within them. And, and what's been really successful is these interventions have been carried forward into physical uh, laneways that are shared, that have kind of galvanized all the edges around those laneways into kind of prosperous places for business but they, they are still embedded with creativity and art. And I think it's really important that we start to look at those two uh, together and invest in those spaces. Over to you, Will. So during lockdown, we've been fortunate enough to have time to reflect. And I think we've had some fun producing some ideas and playful reimaginings of how streets and spaces could be, you know, if we reclaimed a bit more and had a bit more autonomy over the, over the fabric of our cities. So High Croydon is, is a modular kind of system of parts that ultimately can start to incrementally occupy and animate spaces. Um, this one in Croydon, but it could ultimately be any city in the country, albeit the world. Looking at how digital technologies can start to interface, uh, planting ultimately bringing back that biophilic nature, and also employing subtle ways of how we manage the climatic changes of the city as we go forward with the wider emerge climate emergency. Um, it's been really interesting looking at digital technologies and intelligent spaces, looking at how we learn from these tactical spaces, um, monitoring how they use, programmatically seeing how we can evolve and adapt them over time, get, gather data, provide information about cultural events, but also about responding to the climatic conditions, whether that be water management or air quality, and really understand how making space is much more user friendly and, and people scale can start to really impact on the economic, social and environmental sort of elements across the city as a whole. Um, here we've had some fun, kind of reference to another bridge you might have seen in, in, in the past. Um, here we use a existing infrastructure, adapting and reusing uh, Westminster Bridge, creating space, you, you know, there's a lot of space there. And if we start to, you know, reconsider and reconstruct how the bridges are used, how public realm is used. There's actually quite a lot there that we can accommodate active travel. We've seen a rise in people using cycle, uh, bicycles across our cities. We've seen people wanting to walk more. They don't want to get on public transport. And also with St. Thomas's Hospital, it creates a buffer for them. It creates a green space, an oversaw space for them. Um, green space is vital for rehabilitation in the healthcare system. And I think we've got to start looking at a preventative model again. We've, we're already seeing doctors in there prescribing health and well-being. We've got ideas of uh, forest bathing coming over from Japan. And I think that's really interesting to see that green infrastructure is playing a part in the healthcare system and social infrastructure of our cities and taking the burden off of an overstretched system. Here we, we took, a, took an opportunity to look at, at Bath, a World Heritage Site, um, UNESCO status. And we thought if we can play here, we can really play anywhere. And, you know, taking the nod from um, John Wood's design of Queen Square, where the, the phrase wood for the trees comes from, we've really lost sight of how we see our public spaces. And our great cities aren't just seen for the, the architecture, but for the great boulevards and, and streets. You know, if you think about the Ramblas or other spaces, they're really part of it. And Pulteney Street has lost that integrity. It's got the great Georgian architecture, but there's real scope to add more and bring that playful nature back, not just for the, the tourists, which I think is where the the climate of Bath's culture is driven, but for the residents, it's, it's got to be a mixture of both. And by creating this kind of mixed use space, looking at how we, it becomes a 24 hour space and looking at phasing. So we're not looking at removing the car immediately because there's still a demand for the car in all of our city spaces, but how we can start to programmatically see how public spaces can be used, bringing the car back for parking at night when people go to work, 
but in the day it can be occupied for daily meetings, for school, for different mums, for elderly, it could be pick up points, we could look at reducing the last mile of deliveries, perhaps prescription, having a really holistic space where you come and do more than one activity, but ultimately you're experiencing the public realm in a very different way and through a subtle and few fairly low cost interventions, we could start to see this change and how it could inform the future of our, our city environments. And, and post pandemic placemaking is obviously going to be really looking at the, the high street and, and for us, the high street is a kind of a, a key component in, 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 and a key piece of fabric for the community. And I think in, in this COVID world that we've, we've been living in, um, the high street in, in some cases has actually become the focal point for people. It's the place where they can interact and see some, um, see some friends maybe from a distance, but also reconnect to the, the local um, shopkeeper that they kind of almost return back to our roots in what we were maybe 50 years ago. And it's really about looking at more than just the real estate of a high street. It's really about revealing and supporting the, the significance of our public spaces. And, and in this particular project, we're looking at the revelation of Red Church Street. And it's, a, it's essentially a street re redeemed that goes well beyond uh, the traditional retail. Um, and we kind of framed it within um, three, uh, I guess, uh, commandments as such commanding principles. And that was celebration, congregation and revelation. And and these, these aren't kind of principles that are just isolated to, uh, to Red Shirt Street. These are principles which we should be looking and incorporating into all our, our high streets, where, where the actual kind of um, local makers and the local businesses can be actually part of um, the community. Um, we can start to kind of create more flexible spaces that support celebration and congregation. And we can be start to bring in those biophilic elements as Will was referencing before to make the street far more than just about retail but more about that experiential um, moment as you enter into a streetscape and then we're looking at greening uh, the grey and that's looking at these old veins of grey infrastructure which are kind of characterized across all the cities around the world and towns and starting to make them into vibrant multifunctional veins that are about social spaces but actually importantly about reconnecting ourselves to nature and so we've been looking at um, projects including uh, some such as in Melbourne which this project is where we're actually transforming these these pieces of grey infrastructure into ecological corridors that support biodiversity that actually support social functions recreation they're about reinterpreting the urban fabric and making these actually engaging spaces for people to connect to but we don't just see it about land as well. We're also really excited about the opportunity of water. We are, um, I guess, as, as a society, we do have an affiliation and a connection to water. Our cities are primarily located along river corridors or coastal edges. And, and yet our kind of industrial roots have kind of provided us with this deep, tangible relationship with water, such as canals and various docklands. But as, as a 21st century, we are not necessarily engaging with them properly and allowing these spaces to be actual ex extended canvases for people to utilize. And, and we're really interested in looking at docks. And this is a project we're working on at the moment and how 10 hectares of vacant water, which is not utilized whatsoever, become, can become an extension of the urban fabric. It can kind of get people to engage in leisure activities within the water, but it can actually get you to live on water. Uh, and this can be modular, it can be kind of um, delivered in multiple ways, but it's actually bringing um, wetland habitats, play zones, aquatic baths, and all other programs all within a kind of living, um, living uh, area of, of a water body. And then looking at um, a, a current project. So this is just an interesting example of a project that we were commissioned on at the very onset of, of, of COVID-19. It happened almost at the same time. And so um, it meant that we were having to kind of engage in a project in a very virtual world. Even our community engagement became purely digital. But actually what was really interesting and by kind of having that limiting constraint in some sense, not allowing to meet people face to face, we actually saw a huge um, kind of increase in numbers of people wanting to engage with the project through uh, the online website, which we created. And, and in particular, we're looking at East Street in Bristol, and this is a historically significant high street. It was at one point one of the most important high streets in Bristol, but as many high streets um, in, in across the UK have, have faced, they've changed and its kind of focus of industry shifted. And with that, the kind of um, the purpose of this street became a lot more um, 
spread out and, and less intensified around what the community wanted. And so if we fast forwarded to today, this is a high street in decline and we're looking at around 24% um, vacancy rates along the high street, which is well above the national average. And it's a high street that is, is primarily focused on retail and not really providing that, um, that broad mix and array of uses that are trying to attract a, a broader demographic to the high street. Um, so in the first stage, we were looking at very much the strategic state, which is where we're at now. We haven't actually got into any detail, but this strategy was really starting to look at how we can reimagine these spaces and how the street can become a, an extension of the animated urban fabric. And that was looking at pockets, parks. It was looking at kind of embedding tree line corridors where to allow for maximizing shade. It was about creating flexible pedestrian prioritized spaces. So strategically, we have a strong understanding of what we're wanting to achieve. And what we found is with the, with the COVID-19 crisis, we can start to actually uh, instill and test some of these, this thinking. This wasn't necessarily uh, considered as part of the brief. And it's something, although we advocate for is quite often not necessarily part of a project but with COVID-19 we saw this as an opportunity and and rather than taking the approach as Will referenced in the beginning of, of creating social barriers which are these kind of construction work kind of um, ways of increasing social distancing we wanted to apply more of a creative approach and and we're seeing all this around the world um, so we're thinking why can't we make the high street become a creative platform on which we can kind of I guess allow people to have feel more comfortable with a, within a social atmosphere. And so with, with um, East Street, there are three particular challenges we're facing in improving its social performance. Firstly, there's about 14 to 20 buses that travel down the street an hour. There's also uh, an incredible amount of um, uh, street elements and uh, bollards totaling about 300 street elements across a 300 meter stretch of public realm. So these, although are permeable, almost create an invisible barrier um, to pedestrian connectivity. And also with that, there was a lot less um, space for people to set up outdoor seating. So the businesses didn't really have any alfresco dining space, um, which meant that they were limiting their kind of obviously economic opportunities. So we were looking at low cost measures. We're first of all looking at um, on street painting and how can we start to interpret um, a better way of engaging people in their space and shifting behavior and also looking at temporary furniture as well that could be both temporary and permanent dependent on um, on the use at the time. And we we promote, uh, propose it as calling joining the dots. And we thought, well, why don't we start to use the street elements, which are actual physical barriers, as almost like um, points at which we knit the street together by, by using uh, low cost paint. And the idea there is we start to kind of increase the paint lines where we want to engage in more pedestrian prioritized hotspots so that the buses would automatically understand that this is a space that's really about people. We also were going to use the paint line to actually demarcate a reduced width for the bus to travel down rather than it being five to six meters in length at certain, or width in certain areas we're wanting to limit to about 4.2 meters. And so we looked at a bold paint work and we kind of tested it with the client team to ensure they were happy with it and we're looking at kind of uh, the idea of having a paint that connects to the edge of the current paving um, but also has the potential to expand to, to the bollards, knitting this place together. I'm working with uh, Romy and Vestra. Um, it's about bringing in some of their furniture as well to start to create more opportunities for people to socialize and linger. And this was also about uh, encouraging local businesses to bring in some of their own temporary furniture to utilize the laneway, uh, the, the loading bays uh, off peak periods. And, and this is a kind of vision of what this place could be like. And this is the discussion we're at the moment is trying to get this um, over the line so it can be delivered. Um, but it's about creating that space that is actually more than just a road with people tucked to the side. It's about making it a kind of creative platform for the Bedmans community to connect to and, and, the, and the rich culture that lives there at the moment. So that was a, this is a, a project that's kind of, um, I guess, in its mid stage and I guess it's a work in progress and hopefully at some point we might be able to show the temporary becoming the permanent. Um, but I'm going to take us over to a project that we've, um, I guess, completed in the last uh, year or so and it's been a six year project and it's been a great opportunity to exemplify high street renewal.
So if we uh, take you back over to Australia, and this is a, a regional centre, really like many town centres uh, in the UK, it's just a, a small centre that supports a local community. And it's located in the Hunter Valley, which is part of a wine region. But Maitland was always kind of the, the, the poor sister, the poor brother. It was never really seen the value and all these other centres were tended to get the tourism and the people wanting to live there. But what was really interesting about this is it has a hugely rich her historic fabric and it is a heritage precinct. So there's, a, there's already a rich architecture to work with and, and with the curvilinear um, high street, we're like, how can we start to kind of celebrate this historic architecture with a more progressive public realm? We also had to deal with periodic flooding as well to make sure it's resilient. But there has been interventions more recently, such as the levy, which has managed that. But like many centres, it was dealing with out of town shopping um, and that out of town shopping was actually taking away a lot of the business. And what we're seeing here is a, is a vacancy rate of 50 percent, so well above what we see in the UK. So this was a dying high street. Um, but yet it had this rich historical fabric. And so we were commissioned um, to lead a team in looking at the revitalization of this project. And we, we really wanted to kind of um, not only look at the high street as an opportunity to create a, a social platform for the community to engage with, but we wanted this high street to connect to the river, um, a, a valuable green infrastructure asset that at the moment, like many centers had turned its back on. So we looked at firstly stage one and that was looking at unlocking the high street's economic potential and that was really about expanding public life, providing tourism infrastructure and also additional accommodation to, uh, to capture the overnight domestic market. Um, embedded uh, integrated WSUD system harvesting so that the actual trees were not just about kind of providing shade and canopy, they were actually uh, collectors of water which could be kind of recycled and reused in the area. Um, and it was about creating and shifting a pedestrian only mall into a shared flexible street. We called it a complete street and that complete street was idea about respecting the city's local heritage, but creating a, a street that had the ability to modify as the land use has changed over the day or week. Um, the project has really looked at success, uh, successfully enabled the economic regeneration. We're seeing that vacancy rate of 50% become zero. We've actually connected all the local businesses and the local makers to the actual high street. So this high street now has become kind of characterized by the local trades, the local wineries, the local leather makers. They're all starting to use the space. And, and so with this public, um, public realm, we're seeing a real shift in use of the high street. It's a multifunctional programmable space. It supports the markets at both day and nights. It's also a cycleway. It's also a kind of um, shared street for people to utilize and sit in. But as I said, it was also about connecting uh, the river and the high street together. And so the key to that was creating a river link gateway. And by identifying a building that was in poor condition, that was not used and of no value, we looked at kind of removing that and creating a punctuated river link gateway that connected the two together. It was a real opportunity to seed regeneration because we didn't see the high street as just the frontages. We saw the high street is also looking at the rear of, the, of the, these buildings so that the actual riverscape can be an activated extension of the high street. The building wasn't just about building uses, it was about dedicating 70% of the footprint to public space, but also still accommodating a cafe, um, restaurant and library facility within it. And this was about celebrating the river, taking an asset that had been seen as a fearful area of flooding and making it into actually a valuable extension of the high street fabric. And what with using natural materials, locally crafted brickwork, we were able to kind of create a, a form with our architects in, in a space that actually started to resonate with the historical fabric of the city, of the, but actually in a modern interpretive way. And this, was, this has been a really successful project in, in really demonstrating how with targeted investment and a real reshift in how the public use of space and the uses around it, uh, a high street can be regenerated. And so how can me and Will wrap up? Well, I guess it's simple and you've probably heard it many times this period, but don't waste a good crisis. Yes, this is a hugely challenging period for society and it is a real problem in terms of health and, and the well-being of people. But it's also an incredible opportunity to shift our perspective and valuation of our city fabric. There's been many pandemics in the past and every pandemic we've come back stronger and we've rethought how do we improve our, our urban environments. And so this COVID-19 presents that opportunity and we're already seeing cities do that. 
in Paris, they're looking at the 15 minute city where everything can be within 15 minutes walking distance and accessibility, limiting the use of the car and creating a socially healthy place for people to live. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mike and Will. Um, I, I think we should have a virtual round of applause. It feels it feels wrong just not yet not being able to do that. Um, that was absolutely brilliant, and um, I mean really reassuring that you know this kind of great work is going on. And I think your final case study was was just so positive. It proves exactly what what public realm can do if it's done well. And um, I was talking last week about my fear that this is going to end up being all about knee-jerk reactions and beer gardens and I hope that you know actually what what will come about is that these projects that are already out there and being worked on by extremely um, professional experienced people will be expedited so I think that's what we have to hope for. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions that are burning that they'd like to ask. Um, I'm going to bring Jane in at the moment as well uh because of her work with the high streets task force and particularly your last few slides on um declining high streets and the issues and you know 50 percent um poss possible sort of deterioration in in retail and empty premises is, is pretty horrifying and i'm sure we're seeing that ourselves in our local high streets um all over the place um so if anyone has any questions please do put them up there but the first one i think is maybe to you Jane, on the back of this, um, will these sort of meanwhile um, opportunities test the ideas that we need to test well and encourage better participation in the design process, as we've seen it obviously can do um, with the work that Will and Mike and many others are doing? And will we will we bring about more meaningful outcomes through through this approach in in the sort of temporary sphere? Yeah, I, I just like. To Congratulate uh, Mike and Will on a really good presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And you touched so many important issues that we're facing at the moment. Um, but to answer your question, Romy, um, I, I like you, I'm afraid that sometimes we have this, uh, the town centre knee jerk reaction and put up a whole load of bollards and uh, pedestrian barriers to uh, facilitate um, a need, an immediate need, and then they tend to become permanent. For instance, after uh, a, a number of uh, terrorist attacks um, all around the world, uh, Birmingham City Council decided they were going to put up some temporary barriers for Christmas uh, to make the um, Christmas market safer. Now, not only were they left there for Christmas, but they were left there, they've been left there for years, and they look awful, and they actually uh, stop pedestrian movement. So that is my fear. But I think that there's a change in mindset um, amongst the general population. I think expectations have been uh, have changed. I think people want something better. They've seen how it's been easy to walk around our towns and cities without all the cars and the lack of pollution. And they've enjoyed it. And um, whilst epidemics and pandemics have their temporality and uh, we all sort of in that mindset for a few months, we've got to be careful we don't just go back to the old norms. So I guess we've got to um, um, really jump on the bandwagon and keep this conversation going and make sure that people's expectations now they've been raised are uh, that the the product the projects are, are delivered mm. uh, and I think uh, temporary installations really do have a, uh, a place particularly the, these great examples that both Will and Mike have shown today I think they're really important and of course it's something that architects have done for years they've mocked up rooms for clients to see especially very technical um, um, spaces in buildings so they can understand how they're going to use it. Why not do the same for the general public to understand how they could use their high street in a completely different way? Because high streets are no longer going to be the place just for shopping. Mm -hmm. And um, with my high street task force hat on, on behalf of the Institute, um, I think there was uh, before the pandemic, there was a definite feeling that uh, 
her food, drink, and that sort of thing was going to rescue the high streets. And in fact, my fear is now that there's going to be a lot of little independents are going to disappear and it's going to take years for them to come back. So I think temporary is good. Temporary installations that are changing and testing and um, challenging the norm are absolutely brilliant. So I'm quite excited and I would really love to see something in my own town of Sutton Coalfield, which was dying a death before COVID. And as I think there's only a third of shops that were open four or five years ago are actually open now. So, you know, we've got to do something um, about the high streets. Um, without sort of wittering on, one other thing I'd like to say, I do think there's been a lot of talk in the last few weeks about people not wanting to go into the big cities. They're worried about using public transport and there's definitely a focus on, on um, local um, high streets. And in fact, I was talking to somebody from the co-op uh, their proper one of their property people who's saying they've never had it so good um, there's been a real focus on shopping locals so mm. yeah we've just got to get out there and 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 get support from you know high level government support right down to local place managers and town centre support to get this going no thank you i think that i think that's absolutely the case i think it's it's how are we going to see these temporary measures now informing and inspiring the medium term the longer term and the permanent design of these spaces and it it has to have an impact um at some point doesn't it i've got uh, did you want to respond michael will at all to jane will are you gonna go or do you want to um, go and then i follow yeah i think something that i've been we've been talking about is perhaps that we look at a programmatic approach in, in, in the intermediate to how people get on or, you know, we're looking at flexible working hours and how maybe we phase the schools arrivals and leaving so that we're not stretching the existing infrastructure so that, you know, there's not that mad rush at nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning and five o'clock in the evening. If we start to really measure that and maybe even move to a four day working week and shift it around, we're then taking the, the stress off of that. And I think that's a really intelligent way of how we can start to move people around on longer journeys. Yes, we've all become very ultra local, but I think we do need to start to consider how we go back into central London, central Bristol, Birmingham, and how we reduce that fear and, and contact, given that we still need to be socially distant. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think also the you know um, people in this in this pandemic period have obviously really valued the space that they can access, um, and also probably highlighted the space the space they can't access. And I think um, it really emphasises the importance then in how we should be um, looking at the climate agenda as well as the COVID agenda. The two are yeah. the, the, we can't forget that. And I think um, then reality climate change is and COVID of kind of working together really to kind of make us push us in a direction there is no we can't go back to business as usual it's it's mm -hmm. pretty simple climate change is is there if we don't respond and we don't proactively change the way we conceive and deliver our cities and our urban infrastructure we're not going to have a lot of uh, a lot left you know people aren't going to be attracted to be in a city if it doesn't provide that resilience so i think we have to be quite radical we have to kind of treat the landscape as the almost the heroic part of a city and i think you know i know me and will have had numerous conversations at how the public realm and the landscape architecture side has always been the kind of subservient part of the project and it's always been the secondary afterthought of, and do we actually need it um it is actually the most important part. And, and I think, you know, um, if, if anything, hopefully COVID and climate change really emphasize that. And that means planning policy has got to completely change. Developers have got to rethink their valuation models. You know, it has got to be a whole game changing paradigm shift if we're going to be able to enact both socially and environmentally quick enough. Mm, that, and that's the permanent outcome that we want to see, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, for sure. I've got a question from Andre. Thank you. She says, fantastic presentation, great change of perspective from corporate to personal and family. And maybe another one for you, Jane, with your work on health and well-being. She's asking how we can start swapping out hard surfaces in our streets. And I know this has come up through, um, I've been involved a little bit with Andre at the Sustainable Landscape Trust, and those questions have been raised there. You know, is there too much paving, too much hard, um, for sure, not enough green infrastructure? She's saying, how can we swap out hard surfaces in our streets to more planted 
places and spaces, in, including trees, shrubs, um, and food plants. Yeah, I, I, really good point. And, um, um, we uh, we did an exercise uh, a few years ago about how we could re-green um, uh, Birmingham, not dissimilar to some of the exercises both Will and, and Mike have done. And, and I, I think it, uh, as uh, Mike suggested, it's going to take a, a rethink about how we value land in cities um, and the fact that landscape has always been a, a nice to have rather than must have, especially the green um, side of landscape design. And um, I think uh, that some of the sites at the moment that are, are waiting for redevelopment, uh, I think there should be a, um, a review of those. Uh, most, a lot of city centres, central city centres, uh, rather than the sort of the, the, the immediate suburbs, but the, the central cities are really hard, really grey. And in fact, 80% of our public realm is, is our roads and the landscape, uh, the green spaces are just the leftover bits that actually are very difficult to, to design and manage. Um, so I think there has to be a, a shift in how we value land uh, uh, to start creating some really good quality green spaces in our cities and the important thing is is that they are connected with green routes and um, I think that um, getting people to connect with green and to understand nature and to love nature means that people will look after it and uh, then uh, appreciate the uh, sort of life-giving qualities of nature and the importance of, of healthy eating and exercise and all those sort of things. Um, I think it, it's bottom up, top down. So local communities working together to do something in their own street is really important, or even shopkeepers and business owners getting together to do something. So some of the bid districts in cities have done work to try and improve their areas. Uh, so, but it's, it's also strategic. So the city councils and uh, local authorities have to be able to you know, create the right atmosphere for these things to happen, all to fit into a, a bit of a jigsaw, all to fit together into a into a plan. I don't know if that's answered the question or <laughs> I rambled off it. So <laughs> I think Sorry. there are so many questions and so I many know, answers. And there are so <laughs> many answers. There's no right way or wrong way of doing no. it. Just and, and with, to do it. <laughs> it. It is exactly. And green infrastructure, it always seems to be with trees, you know, how on earth do you even get them in amongst the utilities obviously in, in any normal city or, or high street um, and you know planters the, the volume and what you put in them and the irrigation and the maintenance you know I mean those are the questions we see more often than not um, I, don't, I don't know if you've got experience I mean Mike and Will your work you know clearly shows a lot of blue green infrastructure in there you know how do you get around those kind of questions and concerns it's i mean from a it's it's simple we we use at the moment historically gray infrastructure as a form of drainage um we've just pipe it in pipe it out it's there's no kind of value in actually that resource and i think um what we're really looking at is how can you use nature-based solutions as a way of kind of rethinking that gray infrastructure and and that that's where gray uh, that's where the gray becomes green and that's where you can embed more um, planting and more kind of natural solutions to our urban uh, cityscapes and I, and I, and I, I it's interesting because I've been working you know I've guess I work in China and Australia and I've been back in the UK for a lot quite a while now and it's really interesting to see how um, how different cultures interpret their public realm and I think Australia for example um, yes there's hardscape used but it's actually they do tend to kind of really value the kind of public realm and parkscapes um, and there is more greening there because they're dealing with quite more extreme weather changes you could be sitting there on a 36 degree 40 degree day one minute and then next minute you've got a flash flood coming in and you know it, it's completely uh, it's a, such a transient environment there that they are trying to cater for it so um it's whereas the UK I think it's got quite traditional roots in how it's kind of um, designed its public realm and I think you know if you go back to the kind of um, you know the Georgian period yeah we would have very hard based responses and our kind of it's almost like the way we see it as our parks are enclaves of green and our streets are the kind of thoroughfares of movement um, and activity and and yet we don't see the 
the, the two mesh together and I think we have to rethink that I think um, maintenance is always going to be a question because that's how people uh, that's the big problem at the moment and I think again this goes back to the, the planning system and the policy we need to rethink how our maintenance models I think Jane touched on it really well communities can be part of that as well they could be part of that maintenance give them a sense of ownership give them more freedom to actually um, be part of that kind of um, that kind of restoration or remove you know improvement of their public realm so yeah I, I think we have to I mean you I think infrastructure and drainage is a key way of kind of pushing it <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's like another it's like a kind of chess piece it's a move that I think is going to be it's more value if it's softer um, and that's a way of doing it more immediately and then I guess the other parts the maintenance is a kind of ongoing discussion yeah i think yeah. it's also just to build on all of that i wrote no no or low maintenance based on most of the client briefs that we've had in the last 10 yeah. years but i think it's yeah. about changing the value system ultimately and looking at how we understand the associated value whether that sort of you know crudely when we look at a client hopefully they're like open-minded but at the bottom line we're, we're looking at building efficiencies and how we can work with the mechanical engineering to make it more you know cooler or better air quality but then that has a knock-on effect to staff performance and people want to be in those spaces and they're more attractive so you're getting more economic value and then spending time and therefore money mm -hmm. if you could, if you bring it back to the basics we are still in a bottom line economy unfortunately and until we start to really integrate all of these things that's how we're having to push it and then we get these much better impactful and enriched schemes off the back of that but the client wants to get bums on seats or bums through doors and so it's really just starting to sort of manage their expectations against how we can really drive positive change. Uh, yeah, I think that's very true. I think that seems like the perfect point to bring in um, your work with the developer, Will. There is a launch of a, a new, um, I guess it is a sort of competition, but an open call for ideas called Radical Rethink. We will send out the link um, with the thank you email to you who've attended so that if you're interested in having a look at that, um, Will is working with um, the developer uh, magazine and people and we're um, also involved in that to uh, find fresh new ideas for um, urban spaces and it's not, it's not really a design competition, it's, it's pretty much any ideas, any thoughts, um, anything that anybody thinks is, is going to bring about the changes that we've talked about today really. So. I don't know if you want to explain any more about that, Will. We'll obviously sort of push that out and make people aware of um, exactly what, uh, what it, it involves and where they can find the details. But please do have a look. And if you've been inspired today to think differently, then you may well want to pour your ideas out and send them in. Yeah, I think ultimately it just came about uh, the idea of having a radical rethink. And we've touched a lot of it today. With... Really? <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody hoovering. <laughs> it's a coffee machine that I think is not. Okay, stop. Um, <laughs> nice. They're getting their own fika. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, it's about it's fresh policy, fresh thinking, um, fresh ideas. Talking with Christine and the team at the developer, and with you guys at Bestra. Um, but it could be policy, it could be place making, it could be parklets, it could be environment. And what will happen is that we're looking for, it's only two page A4, a couple of sketches, some text. We'll then have a look at how it, the ideas and where they sit and theme them. Um, we're looking at an idea that multidisciplinary teams might be favored so we can break down some of the silos and get rid of the egos and really start to think about holistic teams. But also engaging a wider audience, so thinking maybe bringing people from outside the industry or encouraging new people to be part of the industry. And that, that will become part of a panel. So they've been running bite-sized uh, talks. So if you're fortunate to be selected and shortlisted, you'll then present your idea to a panel of experts from academia, from property development, through landscape, architecture, all of the different facets. They'll then be taken forward, hopefully, with some other specialists to help you realize it and create a more deliverable model that will then get presented at the Festival of Place in, in November with a view that hopefully some of these might get realize whether it's policy to government or project to, to place um, and I think it's a really exciting idea um, and I've it's in the developer magazine it's online and I think Romy will share that later today. we will yeah we'll send the link but do, do take a look they're a great team um, they're doing really interesting work they they uh, offer a series of very professional webinars unlike ours we're, we're learning this is the first one obviously um, so yeah do take a look it, it looks really interesting and I think it will spark some more great conversation 
And uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. We promised to stick within an hour, more or less. Um, so just to let you know, we will be running these every month on the 17th, if we can. Uh, we're not sure if anyone will want to join on a Sunday, so we may have to tweak that slightly. But we'll be talking about a sustainable development goal every single month and trying to bring those to life. I think there's a lot of conversation around them and nobody really quite knows what it means. And it actually means what we're doing every day, what most of us are doing in our in our normal everyday work. So we'll try and uh, bring those in and bring them to life, as I say. So we will follow up with this um, email, letting you know about Will's work with uh, the developer and the next um, planned session. And thank you very much. Thank you all of you to the speakers. Um, I've been really, uh, really blown away by some of the conversations and the work we've done. Sadly, the two things that I focused on and fixated on slightly are the fact that you had 186 bollards in East, East Street. I found that astonishing, even though I have seen some pretty bad ones. And also I had to look up um, the RAL for Telemagenta, which is 4010, in case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> it's a slight obsession, I fear. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's what stuck with me as, as much as the fantastic <laughs> ideas. But thank you again, and thank you to all of you who've uh, joined us today. Please do spread the word. We'll let you know about the next one, and uh, hope to see you very soon, if not in between times. Thank so you enjoy very your much. Friday and uh, weekend. Okay, thank bye. You. Bye. Cheers. bye. Cheers.